I'm excited. Um, I am excited because I don't know. We don't know each other. Right. At all. Right. And that's why I asked the questions and gave you a little more info last right. night. Because I was I like, appreciate. we don't know each other at all. And this will be really fun. Yeah. Um, all right. I'll lead in and I'll be brief. Um, cool. So qualify the podcast. A new episode. This is Hassan, your host. And with me, I have Adrienne Wiltsey. Um, this is going to be the biggest hodgepodge everywhere all over the place episode ever um, wow. based on our mutual friend, number one. And then I saw you at Carla Sue's Backyard Brunch podcast. So shout out to Roger Robinson, Ottawa Fashion, Carla Sue, Backyard Brunch podcast, Bridges. I just love these new bridges. There are so many bridges. I would lead in normally just saying oh, she does this and she does that. But I'm going to make this brief. Nomad. Correct. Engineer. Yes. Jeweler. Yes. Healer coach? Spiritual healer, certified spiritual healer. Okay. And all of that is combined into coaching and consulting. I was on target for three out of four. <laughs> um, prior to this, though, uh, we were having that conversation. And literally, and then that doesn't necessarily need to be on mic. It was just really me always. I'm, I'm a junior anthropologist. Like, I'm always trying to figure out, like, where are you from? Where is that from? Because I'm like a, a chimera. Everywhere I go, with the exception of Europe, everywhere I go, they're like, he's from here. And it, it's just, I'm mm. like, I'm not. Um, mm -hmm. But I love it. So in my travels, it was kind of always like, I can kind of grease my way through places. It was really cool. Um, so what, what I found to be interesting um, at first is that from what I knew of you, it was you were more of this free-spirited um, individual that I saw when actually you did, uh, you wore something that Roger creates with Ottawa Fashion. He put it on his page. I saw the hair. I said, at some point in time, I'm going to have to meet you. I like to meet all of Roderick's friends um, because I'm his friend. Um, I am I am Roderick's mirror polar opposite. I'm bizarro Roderick. It, it, it's, <laughs> that's really where it is. He's always positive. I have a rage mm. issue. Like, it's it's just like, it's, it's oh like, God. <laughs> so, it, you know, it, and he, we've known each other since we were kids, uh, like real kids, you know, like, like middle school. That's what he said. Yeah. So. I'm glad he vouches for me because otherwise this would go sideways. Uh, could you could you start educating me on why you would choose to be a nomad? So before we started recording, we talked a little bit about like lineage and heritage. Yes. And I think since I was small, probably like three or four, one of my first memories is being like, I don't know about this place. Okay. Like I did, I grew up in southwestern Kansas. Um, I'd like to say it was a good place to grow up, mm -hmm. a small town. My parents are, I love my parents. I have an amazing relationship with my parents now. I have one little brother. Um, and I just never fit. Right. But what I think really was happening at a very young age is this like longing for what is home. Okay. And so I've wanted to live nomadically. It just like, it feels like it's in my bones, um, for a very long time. And then serendipity serendipity the universe source whatever you want to call it mm -hmm. had opened up the opportunity um about five years ago five six years ago okay and so i took some time to strategically plan a long term po and position myself to make it a reality and at the end of the day part of it is this exploration is like what is home what is place mm -hmm. right we are in on like unseated stolen land. Um, I am the great granddaughter of German immigrants that fled Nazi Germany. Okay. Um, great, great, great of a young Irish kid that stowed away um, wow. during the potato famine. Okay. And made his way to Kansas and was a farmer. Okay. And it's this mix of lineage and like lost cultural connection. Because mm -hmm. like what is culture? Culture is language, food, music, dress. Lost all of that through assimilation okay. to yeah. the US yeah. um, to survive. And so part of the nomadic journey, journey was like figuring out is what is home? Yeah. And how do you live in a way that is in alignment like on some moral, ethical grounds and like, and then in the heart, in the body, yeah. what is it to feel safe in the world? Um, most of my life, I did not feel safe. And so it's been this journey of like, 
how uncomfortable in some ways can I get sure. to push the bounds of safety? Okay. And that happened. And then it was also this journey of what is home? And ultimately home is in my body. Home is like a heart and soul thing for me. Sure. And by having, um, I live in an RV that's named BB the RV. BB the my, RV. <laughs> love Houston. And made the stallion. Um, it just couldn't happen. It was like too easy. I was like, yeah, we're going to do that. Okay. Um, and it's like my turtle shell. I've got everything I want, everything I need. Uh, I can be fully like self-sustained for mm, 11 to 14 days. Okay. And... Um, it's a way to travel with the weather, more connected to the earth. You're very exposed in some ways. Yeah. You know, I wake up and like hear all the birds or yeah. the leaf blower. Either way. <laughs> Either option. way. Yeah. Wherever you are, right? Right. And so it's just been this kind of unpacking of like a lot of lineage shit. Sorry, excuse me. You're fine. No, we, um, we do that. A lot of. We do that shit here. <laughs> okay, cool. <Yeah. laughs> oh, every once in a while, one word or so yeah. speaks out. And and also just a way to to get to know other people and communities better. It's been a big combination of things, but it really was like Houston it, as as far as a place goes is is home. Sure. And it was like I'm in a place with my career, and was just like filling into options and wanting to kind of take my jewelry across the country, and so everything just aligned. Are you are you still an engineer? I mean, I have the degree and I worked there for a decade, so absolutely. Right. Well, is, that, is that kind of how this is, is that a part of the club? Like you're a lifelong member once you... I think so. Okay. So I... For, I respect it. I mean, I get for it. For me, um, one thing that our society does is put us in boxes. Sure. And I I spent some time with someone here in the last few weeks and they're, they're in marketing. They're like, I cannot put you in a box. I'm like, yeah, because I disassembled them and I'm standing on top of them. Yeah. Like, because why would we want to put people in boxes? Sure. I, I earned the degree. I worked in industry for almost a decade. Then I spent three years studying under a fine jeweler. So it's essentially the equivalent of like a master's in fine jewelry. Sure. Earned the heck out of that. Yeah. Um, and now I'm going back to school formally again. And so I think you are lifelong whatever you want to be. Sure. And it's more than just like the piece of paper. It's the experience. It's the embodiment of, embodiment of it. And then how does that impact your daily life, right? Like I am unequivocally impacted by that experience. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Right? I you don't that. just like stop like, oh, let me hang. But that's what society kind of asks us to do is yeah. like, oh, you have to be this, this, or this. Right. When actually all of that experience, all of that knowledge, makes the you. trials makes you... Um, capable of what you can do in the world. So I still consider myself an engineer. Gotcha. Yeah. I, I get it. So within being nomadic, mm -hmm. um, where has that taken you? Where, like where, where has your journey in terms of like geography, where has that taken you? Yeah. So in the United States, it's been 33 states okay. and about 70,000 miles. Mm. Drove the 101 or the Highway 1 okay. um, from like Portland all the way down to, to Palm Springs, okay. which is phenomenal. Yeah. Like if you can take the time to do that drive, the ocean. I, I'm a Such water a person. Deal. Like I love to be in and near the water. The Redwood Ford at Forest is just like the Redwoods are incredible. Ancient. Did you do the like through the Redwood Forest where they cut a hole in the, in yes. the tree? You I drove have, that RV through that tree? Not the tree. At the okay. time, this was pre-pandemic. Okay. So pre-pandemic, I was in an SUV. Okay. And the SUV barely squeaked through that tree. All right. Um, that, that sweet tree is hanging in there. It was pretty incredible. Okay. Yeah, totally did that. What's funny about that is when you go through this tree, I think, is it the chandelier tree? I can't remember what it's called. Um, there's a crowd of people. Everyone who's already done it mm -hmm. is just like standing there staring at you like, oh, are they going to fit? Mm -hmm. And we, like, I had to pull in the mirrors mm -hmm. to get all the way through. Nice. Um, so, yeah, totally did that. Absolutely. Okay. There's like a mix of like, you can do touristy things without getting inundated by tourism. Yes. And so I try not to just roll, like, rule out everything because it's like, oh, that's a touristy thing to do. Well, there's, yeah, because it's super cool it's and fun. interesting, right? Yeah. So you have to do some of the things. Right. And it's a rites of passage. In, in theory, it's a rites of passage for being where that spot is. Yeah. Like, are you just going to be too cool for school and not do it? 
it's literally right there. You gotta there. do it. It's right there. It. Yeah. So yeah, no, it's I, totally I right that. there. And the other thing I think, if I can't, that I, you have to do. I am a huge proponent of like farmers markets and art markets. Okay. Everywhere I go, Saturday, Sunday, sometimes Thursdays, like I am looking up like where's the farmers market. You can read a community and like really get to know a community so mm-hmm. quickly by. Not only like who is selling, but how is that community supported? Yeah. How are your growers, your makers, um, the beekeepers, all of that? Like, how are they really supported by the greater region? Um, so that's one of my favorite things to do on the road, too. I really like I like where this is going uh, because it reminds me of what I like to do when I when I travel. Whenever I go somewhere, it is really not I'm going to knock some touristy stuff out, especially if I'm with someone because they don't think the way I do. And I could be somewhere and never do a touristy thing because I really want to see how the people live and function. Mm-hmm. I think functionality in a society, if I'm just curious as to how stuff works, right. I should be studying that while I'm out here. Like, I don't care where it was, anywhere in the world that I was at. It's like I want to get on the subway instead of get a car and drive her. I want to you know, do mass transportation and just kind of be around them. And, mm-hmm. oh, well, you need to ride in the double-decker bus. I'm like, okay, put me in the front, though. So, like, Which if, is cool it, to is do cool. every once in a while. It is. Yeah. As long as it's a viable experience, mm-hmm. not just that experience. Right. I would be, let me, let me rephrase that by comparison. I would do the double-decker bus in mass transit on a regular basis as opposed to doing the Tour of London double-decker bus. Right. Because that's an identifiable touristy thing. So now let me just get lost in the city because it makes more sense if I can just find my way back. And I'll ride your double-decker bus and that's cool. Mm-hmm. But I want to I immerse myself into this. I want to I see what this is like. Um, as You know, that has its benefits. It has its drawbacks, as I'm sure you, you know, have experienced because safety and uh, communication, you know, language barriers and depending, you know, where, depending on where you go. Mm-hmm. Have you ever taken that to Canada or Mexico? Not yet. Okay. So I spent four months in Mexico, just this, like, just the middle of December to April 1. Okay. Just got back into the U.S. That's um, right. You said that on the radio show. I literally, okay. when we met officially, that was... I think I'd been in the States for like eight days. Okay. Yeah, I was not uh, reassimilated. <laughs> I still don't know that I am, frankly. Like, there are just certain things. Like, and I was on an island. So, like, there's where, just where, this, where like, in Mexico were you? Isla Mujeres. It's in I've, Quintana yeah, it's, Roo. Yeah, right next to Cancun. It's like yeah, 45 so minutes down. Yeah. Most people do a day trip mm-hmm. and they're like, oh, it's touristy and like beach clubs. Yes, and. And. It is four and a half miles long, a half a mile wide at the widest point. Mm. And it is full of, like, beautiful little nooks and crannies and, like, mom-and-pop restaurants that don't open up until 6 or 7 at night. That Like, you wouldn't even know they're there, but you have to, like, get out and walk. Let me let me freak you out and also validate myself. Um, do they still have that cemetery by the beach? Yeah. Oh, that was that was beautiful. So many colors. Mm-hmm. So many colors there. I mean, mm-hmm. it was, okay, wow, yeah. So it's a beautiful, it's a really special place. I'm trying, it's taking all of me, like I have plans for the next couple of weeks and it is taking all of me not to book a flight and go back for a couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. It's uh, the beginning of whale shark season and there'll be 500 to 800 whale sharks off the coast. And one of the uh, beloved locals that I met and became friends with is like one of the top people to go on tour with. Diving. Um, he is a diver, but, but he has a boating service and you can snorkel, snorkel and everything. And I want to see, like, apparently it's one of the best places in the world to see the whale sharks. Okay. So I, (laughs) we'll see if I end up back there or not. I don't know yet. Well, you may as well. I mean, it's a once in a lifetime experience. It really is. If you catch them the right way. Yeah. I mean, so, so, hey, all right. See, I'm trying to control my freak out. So I haven't driven, but. Mexico for four months and then did like right pre pandemic, um, only three weeks in Europe. Okay. So it was like seven countries, 33 states, 70,000 driven miles in the US. Yeah. Where in Europe did you go? Landed in Paris. Good, good, good spot to start. Oh, God, Paris. Yeah. Seriously. Paris to Luxembourg had coffee with one of my distant relatives that their family stayed. Okay. 
which was really cool. Okay. For me, it was really cool. For her, she was like, why are you doing this? I'm like, <laughs> you speak the language. You know the food. You have all the things. And I'm sitting here yearning for a recipe for stroganoff that doesn't include a can of mushroom soup. <laughs> like, I want to make it from scratch, y'all. Like, like, the culture that you have, I have this, like, literal whitewashed American version of it that I can't taste or feel. Sure, yeah. But like something inside me yearns yeah. for it, right? right? Um, so she thought it was like kind of weird, but it was still lovely to meet her. Sure. And very kind. Um, and then so Luxembourg, Germany, Czechia, and then flew back to France. Is that right? Yeah, that was about it. It was lovely. Prague sure. is phenomenal. I've never been to Prague. Um, Prague is and And I... I wanted to. I wanted Super to. Super cool. Um, what do they say? They say it's like the it's like the Paris of Eastern Europe or something like that. Right, and everything is so pr- well preserved mm-hmm. and pristine. Yeah, and the food is phenomenal. Just, it was really lovely. Oh, and the birds. Have you heard about the frog? No. <laughs> okay, so I called them river gulls because they look like seagulls, but they're on this beautiful river. Okay, and they are very well accustomed to and trained to fetch bread like you'll throw bread and the funny thing about it is that i have video i need to post this of like tossing bread and they will just line up and they take turns and it is the most and they will get like within a foot of you organized though and they're organized and like (laughs) squawking right in your face to the point that it freaked me out but it is so funny and these beautiful swans and it was just it was it was a really lovely place to go frogs by the river Mm-hmm. Yeah, the yeah, river runs through it. I probably need to go. I just need totally. to totally. Go. If you go, there are still there are like two restaurants that I have to send you to that you would totally miss. Um, I'm a foodie. I'm a I am foodie. too. Like that, I mean, it's again, other. it's like how you get to know the culture. Eat it. Eat your Absolutely. way through it. Absolutely. Eat your way through it. Learn some it. of the polite things to say, mm-hmm. so people will forgive you for not speaking the language, right? Okay. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully. And then, yeah, eat everything. Yeah, I um, I've danced through Europe a bit. Um, I, I know I've been three times for sure. Uh, and um, my family is in in England. Um, mm. between being on the coastline and being in London City Central, um, but the coastline um, in Kent High, um, right next to Dover Castle, like where the where the oh, limestone cool. are. Okay. Um, but then after that, you know, you just kind of bounce, you know. So I've done a few other countries. Never hit that far deep east past Germany. I just I was in Berlin, Frankfurt, Kaiserslautern. Um, but I never went, I never did Luxembourg and, uh, and I never went past it, but I need to, I need to, um, it's, it, there's something out there that I need to see. Luxembourg was beautiful. It's very small. Mm-hmm. We went just to the capital city. Yeah. It's absolutely gorgeous. Luxembourg is autonomous within Germany, isn't it? You're smack between Germany and France. Gotcha. And like the borders have kind of changed. So that's the other thing. Like some of my family was like Luxembourgish, some of it was German, depending on where the borders were and whatever mm-hmm. else. Um, the other cool thing that I was able to do was um, go to Leipzig, which is where my great grandmother had lived prior to coming to the U.S. and went and found the church she was baptized in, the apartments that they lived in. Wow. And so I have like my picture standing on. You know, and it, it was interesting because, like, part of me felt so at home while everyone else knew you were American. Yeah. It's, like, this very it's strange. Polarity. It's this very strange experience of, like, you get in a place where you're, like, I grew up around a little bit of German and I took some. So it's, mm-hmm. like, you could kind of understand and there's, like, this essence and feeling of, like, a lineage while then everyone else is just, like, refusing to speak German to you. Yeah. Um, kind of again, or like, why are you here? And I'm like, I was hoping the ghost of my great grandmother would show up. Like, what do you think? Why am I I'm here? On a Come journey. on, I'm on a journey, y'all. Like, <laughs> I get to get very, very enthused about this. I kind of feel like my father in certain ways. It's just he, he was, he traveled all over, and that was mostly mm. through the military anyway. But he was just there, like he was just always out and about. He spoke four languages. I mean, it was, That's it, amazing. It, there's a lot of versatility in him. But whenever he met somebody that was from somewhere he went to. We're going to be there for an hour. Like, we're going to, he's going to have this conversation. He might have it in half a language, you know? Mm. Um, and I think that's kind of, I've inherited that interest. I, I bounced around a lot um, when I had the means to do so. And I was very happy about it. I could talk about traveling all day. I could too. 
but we can't. I know so. that's fine. I understand. Um, it's it's such a privilege too. I just will say that it is. It is such a massive privilege, and even me living this way, like I don't have children. I have mm. no pets, no pants, no no pants, plants, <laughs> no pants. I have a dress on. We can talk about that. Um, <laughs> the ginger of fashion. Oh. That was our early non-recorded conversation. Yes. But no plants, pets, or children. Yeah. You know, so, and then all these other ways in which privilege intersect the ability to live this way is real. Yeah. You know. I have a friend that um, that I met actually through this platform when I established it. And she um, would, I think, proper term would be nomadic in terms of what she did. She now lives in Portugal with a partner. But mm. she's traveled um, literally everywhere. She was staying in Timor-Leste for like a year. And... I would just say, well, why would you do this? And she says, virtually the same sentiments as you. She's like, I just wanted to see what was out there. I just wanted yeah. to be around. What's really funny about her is that we we didn't know each other at the time, but we were in Hong Kong at the same time. Oh, wow. And I'm like, this is freaky. Like, you know, just the idea of being able to, like, I passed you up, I know. Because mm -hmm. she doesn't look like anybody else out there, neither do I. So mm -hmm. I would have seen you. And I was in Hong Kong twice during one time. Um, there were significantly less people with year round tans there than the second time I went. So there was like it was maybe a hundred Afri continental Africans. I'm the only African American, but continental Africans in Hong mm -hmm. Kong. And she is um, she's from Algeria herself. Okay. Um, but then the next time I come back, you know, it was a couple of years later, thousand. But it was just migrant. You know, they're just they're immigrating in there for work and, you know, better opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, and I know I would have seen her. It's just that we just never cross each other's path. And now we're talking on a platform just about nomadic, you know, uh, living. She's more country. I'm more city. Like, I I can be amongst the people, but I just need a comfortable bed. You know what I mean? Like, I got back issues. I just want to lay on something comfortable. <laughs> what know? made you want to do jewelry out of any other medium? So I actually paint, sculpt jewelry, amongst other things. Okay, cool. And it was serendipitous. So I quit my engineering job. I was going to just take a little bit of a break, made some jewelry for fun. While at the time I was married, I, my husband then had a business trip and I was just like, cool, I'm going to take some steps to keep myself occupied. A bus full of Michigan tourists came, came in the hotel, yeah. bought some things. It was like October, I believe. I was like, oh, that's cool. I was going to give it away until they asked how much it was. And it just kind of snowballed from there. Came back to Houston. The Houston like market scene was just really picking up. Yeah. And because of where I lived, I lived in the first ward, um, which is was the very up and coming arts district. Yeah. I was seamlessly able to to move into that world. And what was also very serendipitous about it was that as I progressed, I was I said, man, I really need a torch. I need to kneel the wire. I had taken a jewelry class in high school too. I should say that. I had taken a jewelry class in high school studied metallurgy. Um, I like doing things with my hands. And I like the gemstones. Okay. As a kid, it was like, what do you really like? Rocks and the stars. So <laughs> I, had a pet, I had a pet rock too. Heck yeah, um, of course. Road trips always picked up a pet rock. Right. <laughs> I feel that. So I go across the street from where I was living and there's a metal shop. And I was like, hey, I just need to like borrow a torch and nail this wire. And the owner of that metal shop happened to be a graduate of U of H's jewelry making program yeah and they were like cool we have this little office once we got to know each other it's like i'll bring in my jeweler's bench and you can rent the space for me for like 50 bucks a month okay and i'll help you out with some things so i started immediately like soldering there was just like this very gracious universally sponsored from like yeah. god you know like awesome. here let's re let's let's redirect you this way because yeah. i thought i was going to take a break and go back and get a master's um and work in an industry that didn't really fit me, probably. So it just snowballed yeah. over and over. And then I found an incredible mentor through him. And that fundamentally, working with Ernesto, fundamentally changed the way I thought about life. It, it, it really just rekindled about, like, living small, mm -hmm. working intentionally, what work and what creation could look like. He straight up told me, he's like, you will not make jewelry forever. He's like, I need you to paint too. Mm. Okay. I was like, okay, All right. cool. I was like, sure, whatever. I love making jewelry. No, he was right, right? Okay. I love making jewelry still now. And I do it on a very like intentional basis. And 
he was totally right. So I had that journey and then did like Bayou City Arts Festival, um, bigger festivals in Texas and started spreading out. But it was actually, it was never about the jewelry. It was about the connection with people. Sure. At the end of the day. I'm starting to pick that up from you. Um, yeah. If you can say that your medium preference is jewelry, okay, great. So you do jewelry, um, but you really do communicate with people very well. Like, and it's not about your being able to speak. Clearly you can speak. Um, I'm talking about a very intrinsic connection. I just, I really think that the versatility is, is very healthy for us as humans mm -hmm. because I don't like confinement. Now I'm rigid and structured when what needs to be. Sure. I will always make a plan. I'm a, probably always have a plan B. But in that plan, there's like, there's, there's an area for levity. There's an area for fun. There's an area for, Absolutely. you know, the same just people don't make it through that part because they don't want to have the regiment inside of it beforehand. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm more of a, um, an organizational manager than an artist in my later years. I will confess that, mm -hmm. but I was a pure artist though. I really, I really enjoyed the artistry. I just like it in my little box. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting story though, in terms of how you would apprentice. It's actually almost synonymous with my photography journey. Like you end up apprenticing for like one of the top dogs. He was, he, and he, what's funny is I don't think he's making jewelry anymore. And he was easily one of the top jewelers in the world. I would I would not hesitate to say that. He has work in um oh the uh, Museum of Natural Science in the Gym Vault. Okay. Gorgeous tiaras, all kinds of things. I mean he's just, and that's that's like the known work that's in the public that he's done that you can say out loud. I mean just it was one of the most incredible experiences. I mean, when you're learning to set gemstones under a microscope, like that's my standard okay. is under a microscope. I wouldn't set with even just like a headset on, even if it's a, if it's a bezel set, Structure. like it's just not, yes. Right. And, and, and like a level of quality that isn't, I, I struggled with this in engineering at times, but there's parameters, right? Mm -hmm. And if I need to make, I was in the bottling industry you have a set of standards and parameters. And if it's in within that tolerances, your tolerances, you're good. Right. Yeah. And when you look at jewelry and like, I'm making things out of quality materials that should have longevity. So there is a, a bit of a rigidness in terms of how to execute. Okay. So before we dance all over the place, because <laughs> we will, we will, <laughs> um, your, your coaching yes. and consulting, how does that work? So it actually touches a little bit about what you were just saying in terms of having a plan while what I would say is like while being present and finding joy in the process. Okay. So I'm branding myself apparently as the joy and clarity engineer because it really encompasses everything that I care about to a certain extent. Taking engineering principles, the standardization, the methodical thought processes, et cetera, taking, you're breaking down a big problem into bite-sized pieces, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And that's hard to do sometimes, yeah. especially when we have big dreams, pressure, whatever. And then applying the more heart-connected spiritual sense and what I really learned as a fine jeweler, as a creative, about enjoying the process, going with the flow, being open to the possibility, doing things in a way that nobody's done them before. So it's really encompassing all of that. And it was actually Carla. So at the beginning of the pandemic, she started Br Backyard Brunch um, as an Instagram Live. Mm. And she was like, hey, I want to have you on and I'm going to call you a coach. Are you okay with that? And I was like, Carla, I am not a coach. And she's like, yo, you've been coaching me and other people around you. I'm going to call you a coach. And I was like, oh, okay. I was real squirmy about it. <laughs> and it wasn't until about a year-ish later that I was like, okay, I'm going to stand in this yeah. because you're right. And it is a combination. I needed the umbrella of the spiritual healing to be really connected to my own heart and intuition and feel really aligned, which then equals confidence, equals um, and a, a greater attuned ability to listen and be with people mm -hmm. and a whole bunch of other things. So the coaching works with, I have three basic sessions. I start with everyone on 
Um, we do not skip those sessions. <laughs> <laughs> I have clients who try, but I have a mission, vision, purpose. Okay, uh huh. Yeah, gotcha. Send it to me. You're gonna sit down though. You yeah, sit down send it to, to me one. because I hear you, and we cannot look at these other things until we do the work. So we start out with a joy and clarity session. I ask you a bunch of questions. Um, you're gonna probably tell me the things that you've never whispered inside your closet by yourself. You know, like. Because there's possibility for everything. Yeah. And let's get the super expansive if I could do, if I could be, live, etc. Let's get it all out and really explore and play with the possibilities and get a good feel of like where you are. Um, and actually that's done ahead of time with what I've been told is a very extensive um, questionnaire. Okay. I don't think it is, but <laughs> again, I like the details. If it's necessary, it's, it's what necessary, it is. Okay. right? It's necessary and it's thought provoking and gives me a really good read on where somebody's coming from. So we do that first join clarity session. We move into a session around like your mission, mi mission, vision, purpose, mm -hmm. and your core values. And they're not set in stone, but we get a really solid baseline. And for entrepreneurs, I like to do them personally and professionally on the, the mission, vision, purpose. And then from there, we can pick a track. Working over offerings is one of my favorite things to do with people. Okay. Um, a lot of my clients tend to be people that are pivoting or in more expansive um, business endeavors and don't know how to combine the various things that they're doing. Um, that's actually something I don't talk about my clients. Everything is very confidential. Carla, though, beloved Carla has talked about this um, in person. So I will say that's like one of the things we did together sure. was look at, okay, you have Brad Garrett Brunch, you have Carla Sue, you have these different things that are all interrelated. But how do we communicate that to your community? And what are the threads that bind them together? It's like a Venn diagram, right? Yeah. That's it. But it's hard to do alone sometimes, right? Yes. It's hard to do alone. You have your head in the soup. We don't know what's in the soup because yep. <laughs> we're drowning in that. You're drowning. Right? Yes. So we don't know what the ingredients are. So we get to step back and pull back. So we do those two sessions and then go into offerings, go into, I have many clients that have an abundance of products and creativity and don't know where to go. And so we're going to look at your pricing and your overhead and do some basic financials and make sure you're making money. And sometimes you're not, and that's okay. It's just the facts. Mm -hmm. Nobody's in trouble. Yeah, that's it. We're going to look it, at the data. It's yeah. where we start, right? And then we're going to make decisions. And that may mean cutting product lines and coming up with a plan on how to turn that those goods into cash. That may be reevaluating and, and realigning. Like you always come back then to that mission, vision, purpose, and your core values. Yeah. And getting people a structure, because as creatives, we want to make everything. And is it serving our community? And our clients inherently are our community. Yes. And so we have to have something to measure against that. And that's why those first three sessions are super important, um, so that we don't get lost on the road. And then there's a few other options, but those are, those are the two probably bigger things. Also do a lot of boundary work. Um, not a therapist, and I will recommend like, hey, <laughs> I think this would be a really good thing to I talk to one. a therapist about it. And um, because I've had to do a lot of boundary work and I have worksheets for everything that have just kind of flowed out, ultimately your boundaries are going to get tested as an entrepreneur. Yes. And having a place to start to process that and then take that to a professional if needed is great. And so we do some of those things. And that's kind of the meat and potatoes of it all. That is um, incredibly similar to how I process things now. Now. Mm. Wasn't before. Um, I was a fireball before. I was just, it, I was a squirrel on cocaine. It just, it was just everywhere, everything, <laughs> anytime, anywhere. It didn't matter. Um, it was very, very hard for me to focus. I'm not sure what made me take the turn. I mean, I'm sure a lot of life, maybe some trauma and drama mm -hmm. got me there. I became incredibly introspective over the past, since 2017. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's just do that. So since 2017, things have been very, very, like I need to be in a vacuum in order for me to process what must be done. And now out of the vacuum 
I can function because that is in that area is where I've made my plan. But the components of what you're talking about, effectively taking a lot of raw material mm -hmm. and, and putting it into a mold that you will at least need to look at. You don't need to adhere to it, but at least you got it. Like, right. so from here, you know, you, you have something that you could follow and reference when you're going along. And I think just for, I'm a structure person, but just for the sake of structure, it helps people to under, you're helping people to understand that that is something that at least in that small light, that's something that you could use in order to keep your life in order. Mm -hmm. I really like this. Um, it's about alignment. Yes. And how do we stay aligned? Yeah. And when we're getting pulled in a million different directions and then we're super creative or, you know, struggling financially or like in relationships, whatever that is, it's how do we maintain our alignment? Yeah. And that's the piece that I almost left out is the spiritual healing part. It's not um, required and it's incredibly helpful. We're all going to get tested. And those like, I, I say that people are inherently easy to love. Our maladaptive behavior patterns and self-soothing mechanisms are not. Mm. And they're going to show up in all of our relationships, including our business relationships. So do you want to keep getting angry? Do you want to keep like getting irritated about your assistant or your clients or whatever? Or do we want to like dig a little deeper in a really safe, expansive environment and be held and contained and remove and soften, remove some of the layers and like soften that pattern yeah. so that life's just more easeful sure. and we're more nourished. And that stuff's going to come up as we do the sessions and then we have the option because we're always in choice. Do we want to look at this deeper right now? Or, and I usually, I throw into every package, like we're going to do, depending on how many sessions, like two spiritual healing sessions that are just that. Or do we want to bookmark this and come back to it a later date? And that gives it this, like, I think this holistic approach where it's not just the facts. When it's, when we're looking at the numbers, it's just the facts, but it's also like, I hate doing taxes and I have this memory of X, Y, and Z or this fear. Mm -hmm. Cool. I feel you. Let's look at that because we shouldn't have to be anxious every time April, whatever rolls yeah. around. Right. Yeah. And insecure and scared. Hmm. So I take that approach to really hold and contain people in a more like wholehearted way. I want to dig more into this. I will, I would also, because I know that you, you, you move around. Um, but I want to make, I want to make time for this at a later time frame because I have some questions that are starting to flow through my head mm -hmm. now. And I, and I just want to, I want to run them by you. For the interest of time <laughs> and 59 traffic, yes. um, we could, we could pause on this unless there's something else you want to talk about. I think the only thing I want to say, because this keeps, this is a theme and it's a theme in my own life with my own projects right now is Working in a way where we can see the big picture, the big goal, and break it down and not get discouraged, yes. but find the joy in the, in the little wins, find the joy in the failures and the learning is what keeps us, keeps our momentum and, and will allow us in five, 10, however many years to get to that big dream. Yeah. It took I was a little kid wanting to live nomadically, right? Mm -hmm. It took a divorce and a massive healing journey and then several years of planning for me to get rid of, give away, sell 85% of my worldly goods wow. and put the rest in a five by 10 um, storage unit and take the risk. Say, I'm going to live nomadically until I don't anymore. Sure. Right? Because people want to know like, oh, how long is this going to go? And it becomes part of your identity. And I'm like, whether I live sedentary in one place or I continue to live like this, like it's more about a mentality and a way I consider and interact with the world than the action. And so my point is, is that it takes time for us to make these big moves and build the dream yeah. and not to get discouraged. And so that's part of the work that I do with clients too is, is we have like... <laughs> It's an activity I do like, like to do with people. It's like uh, things I hate about my life. Is that the, is that the call? Of it? It's titled something really cute. But it's basically that. It's like let's get everything out and then let's break it down. What can I change? What can I um, surrender? And what can I – what do I have to live with and what does it look like to live with those things, mm -hmm. right? And so it's like 
breaking things down in manageable bites and knowing that this is a, this is the journey, not the destination. Yeah. And it, so you can keep going. I think it's encouraging. I mean, clearly, um, I always like having the conversations with like-minded people. You had asked me about why I do the podcast or what a little bit about the podcast. Effectively, the reason why I wanted to do this is for situations just like this. Um, and, and what I mean by that is when I used to go around, I've, I've done a lot of globe trotting, but when I used to do that, what I really miss, what I truly miss about that isn't the stamps on the passport. Mm -hmm. It's honestly being able to sit in a tea shop, a coffee shop, a store, and just strike up a conversation with someone who seems to be interested in why the hell you're there. And also now we can find commonality in that. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just, it's rare to do. We're in a, this is a big city. So we don't have time to really communicate in this way unless you're in your small little townships or communities. And of course you'll meet the new people that come in places that I've been Everybody is from everywhere. No one is from there. And we all need to try to figure out exactly how to mm -hmm. survive in this, you know, expatriate scrap pack, so to speak. And I miss it so much, which is why this conversation in particular has become probably one of my favorites that I could have had. I, I'll be very honest with you in in a very short span of time, which is the reason why I would kind of want to continue it. But we'll make time for that. Mm -hmm. um, Adrienne Wiltsey, can you let everyone know where to find you? Absolutely. So my website is the, T-H-E-A-R-W, for Adrian Rochelle Wiltsey, dot com. And you can find me on, at Instagram under the same, or my full name, which is Adrian R. Wiltsey, Instagram, Twitter, and soon TikTok. <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> I know. Oh, I know. Oh. I'm doing it. I have a TikTok that is, this is Adrian. Okay. And I'm going to make the leap because uh, everything I read, it's you've got 12 to 16 months for that platform to really leverage it as a new interest-based platform sure. versus a who-you-know platform. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, I can I'm going to go for the moon on that one. Good luck to you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, you, you'll be able to find me anywhere. Just Google qualified comma the podcast or QLAFD registered trademark. You'll be able to find this episode soon. Uh, look for it towards the end of this month. Other than that, this is Hassan, as always, a joy. Thank you for listening. Thank you for coming. Adrian Wiltsey, thank you for being a part of this. Thank you. This has been really lovely. Awesome.